So, first of all, I realize that many of you are students and 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 uh, uh, may not have had the exposure to malaria that I'm going to talk about. So, you'll get some idea about what I'm going to say. Some basic stuff that we'll talk about. So, the quality of this lecture will be determined by your participation. <laughs> okay. So, interrupt me anytime. We got three hours, so we got plenty of time. Um, if I cut into uh, uh, Ashwin's time, it'll be fine. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, some of the things that we've been doing in my lab, but before I do that, I would like to give you some background about uh, malaria as such. So, malaria is, is a worldwide problem. It's been a problem with us from the time that humanity has evolved. So, there have been malaria in monkeys, there are malaria everywhere, the malaria uh, parasites in, in in, uh, in um, rats and in, in lizards and in snakes and all that. So, it, it's been there from the time of dinosaurs perhaps, okay. So, it, it for humans, oh sorry, um, for humans there are you know, more than 200 million cases, clinical cases of malaria per year, 200 million cases of malaria, more than 400,000 deaths per year, mostly in children under the age of uh, of five and, and mostly in actually sub-Saharan Africa. That's where you see malaria mostly. Yeah. Uh, and about so 90 percent of them mortality is in Africa. So, this this particular term is what I would like you to remember forever. Look at this. 12,500 kilograms of human hemoglobin is consumed by malaria parasites every day. That's 100,000, 1 lakh liters of blood, a lot more than Red Cross can ever collect per day. That's what malaria is. So this is, and because of that, because the way in which malaria uh, has influenced our own growth, because it, most of the deaths occur in children, there is evolutionary pressure to have uh, some way to reduce the mortality due to malaria. So, our own genome has got markings of our interaction with malaria. Many of our own genes have changed so that they provide us with some degree of protection, some degree of protection against severe and lethal malaria. So, it has been around for a long time. Okay. So, what are these parasites? Well, there are more than 150 different species of malaria parasites. Okay. Uh, they infect vertebrates, uh, most m m many different vertebrates. There are only five species that infect human beings. There is Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax. These are the two major parasites uh, that infect humans. And then there are uh, others uh, such as Plasmodium ovale, malaria, uh, which are not as common, but they are significant numbers still. And Plasmodium nolsi, which is actually a primate parasite, it's a pri uh, parasite of primates, which in Malaysia has been shown to actually be uh, infecting uh, human beings as well. More of a forest kind of malaria. Okay, in the forest, people go in the forest and get malaria from the mosquitoes over there. Okay. Uh, these belong to this uh, phylum called Epicomplexin. Epicomplexin is a huge phylum. There are thousands of species probably hundreds of thousands of species of epicomplexin parasites, they are all obligate intracellular parasite, meaning these are eukaryotes that have to live inside another eukaryotic cell. And that is common for all these epicomplexin parasites. And they have uh, uh, very interesting features. Okay? So one of the things that it has is, uh, is the presence of mitochondrial and epicoplast genome. Epicoplast is like a chloroplast. So, all the epicomplexin parasites, these hundreds of thousands of species of epi epicomplexin parasites evolved from an algae. Okay? Just think of that. The algae is where they evolved from and this is sort of interesting how that this, this has come about because this gives you some ideas about what biochemical features of these parasites are different from the biochemical features of human beings and they can be exploited for developing anti malarial drugs or anti epicomplexin drugs. Now, this is something that we will talk about in a minute. So, the c genome has been sequenced and you know uh, the, the lots of work has been done on, on, on the molecular biology of that. Now, 
the parasite life cycle, and this is an obligatory life cycle. You guys can see this uh, over here. I mean, it's a little small, but there may be some uh, seats over here if you want to come forward. You know, there are some seats over here because it's really far for you. <laughs> you can barely see this, but it's okay. So the infection starts with the bite of a female anopheline mosquito, by the only female's bite. Okay, you remember that? Hmm? Okay. <laughs> Males are vegetarian, they go um and drink fruit juices. <laughs> so only females bite, uh, they have to bite because they need to ed lay eggs and they need the hemoglobin and all the proteins uh, that come from that and, 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 and have, have uh, uh, a source of iron. So when the female uh, anopheline mosquito bites, she injects uh, what are the stages called sporozoites. These are motile forms that uh, are remaining door, uh, silently in, in the salivary gland of the mosquito and the mosquito when sh uh, she needs to feed, she needs to put some anticoagulant, right, so the blood doesn't clot and so she spits a little bit, a few nanoliters of, uh, of um, uh, uh, spit that is put in there and it's enough, those nanoliters of the uh, yeah, I, th I, th I think it's not, I don't know which one is, but they, they, they worked on those anticoagulants. In fact, there's been idea about having uh, antibodies to those things to somehow prevent mosquitoes, but hasn't gone much, for, much further. So, when she spits that little bit of uh, saliva, in comes these sporozoites that are inoculated in that. Okay? And when they do that, they actually run around a little bit in the skin and then they finally find, by the way, when the mosquito bites, it doesn't bite into your vein, okay? That's not where the blood gets. It just probes, chuk, 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 like that. And it pulls up blood, and the blood is the one that she sucks it up. Okay? So it's there that the, the sporozoites are hanging around, moving around, till they find a blood vessel, and they go shoop, into straight into the vessel, into the vein, and end up in the liver. So they... Yeah, but it's yeah. Uh, they don't need to probe. They just they just they just okay. essentially okay. exactly. So they essentially just put a little bit of uh, uh, you know lesions on that. So the blood pools around there, and they, s they take the blood from the capillaries that comes out. So yeah, and so they go straight to the liver. And they actually need to go through all the sinusoidal structures. There are a bunch of sinusoidal structures that it needs to go through, and when it ends up in the hepatocyte, that's where it sets up its shop. And at the hepatocytic stages, single sporozoite, one sporozoite going into the hepatocyte is enough. So you may inoculate, a mosquito may inoculate as many as 10, 20, 30, 100 at the most sporozoites. Only one needs to succeed in order for the malaria to happen. When all this time, the only thing you know is that a mosquito has bitten you, nothing else. When it goes into the liver and the hepatocyte, where the replications are. This is one of the fastest replicating stage of any eukaryotic cell. So a single sporozoite within f few days, you generate tens of thousands of progeny parasites. They replicate very fast and they come out of that, uh, these are called merozoites. So this is a called a schizont or a dividing cell and that then gives you merozoites. These merozoites now go ahead and go out of the liver and they invade blood cells, red cells. So it's in the red cell there where the pathology happens. So they go in the red cell, they divide and, uh, and uh, replicate and release progeny merozoites into the blood. See, every time that happens, you get these, uh, these spikes of fever coming up. And that takes about uh, 14 days or so for the actually fever to happen. So it's 10 to 14 days is the incubation time from the time of infected mosquito bite to getting malaria. And malaria then, how many of you have had malaria by the way? That's amazing, very few. You guys all must live in very nice <laughs> houses, <laughs> mosquito protection, bed nets and all that, right? Uh, yes, interesting. No malaria. That's good. I mean, I'm very impressed. Because, uh, malaria, uh, by, by the way, it's parts well protected. well protected. Yeah, all the yeah, DEET and DEET and all those mosquito coil and all that other stuff. Yeah, so, 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Odomas, Odomas Jindabad. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so here we get uh, um, merozoites coming out and then they invade fresh red cells and, and, and continue to divide and get more and more and more to the extent that they start, you know, you can have as many as 10 to the power of 11, 10 to the power of 12 parasites inside your blood. And that's the reason I told you that these parasites, are, because you have, you know, hundreds of millions of cases, they are consuming over 12,000 kilograms of human hemoglobin per day. Because when they are growing up, they need to digest hemoglobin to provide nutrients for themselves and not just that, also to make space. I mean, red cell is in a pretty compact cell. It needs to digest that hemoglobin to make space, you know, for it to grow. So it can grow into progeny. So, single merozoite can give rise to as many as 32 merozoites, each progeny, and then they will go and grow into other, other uh, cells and, and so on. Some of these parasites actually decide not to go through the grind of uh, dividing and multiplying. Instead, they decide that I'm going to go to the next stage, I'm going to be sexually transmitted. So, the transmission occurs uh, through the mosquito and that is absolutely essential. If there was no mosquito, there wouldn't be any malaria, okay. You get rid of the uh, mos mosquito and there wouldn't be any malaria. Okay? It's simple and as complicated, <laughs> okay. And so, they develop into what are the stage called gametocytes. These are sexual forms. They are true males and true female gametocytes and they are taken up by the mosquito okay, uh, when another mosquito feeds and there they will undergo uh, sexual reproduction. Gametes are released from the gametocytes, the male gametes come from the male gametocyte, the female from the female gametocyte, they come out of the red cells, fertilization occurs, so these very much look like sperms by the way, the male gametes look very much like you know, elongated sperms, they, they have just the nucleus and the, and the exoneme for, for it to um, move around. And then they invade the mosquito midgut, this stage called oconete, emerge out at, as, a, as oocyst and this again starts dividing till you have thousands of sporozoites from each fertilization event that has occurred. So, mating and fertilization is absolutely critical. If that does not happen, you will not get malaria, there would not be malaria. So, this is a very complicated life cycle all done by a fairly small genome. It's only 23 megabase, okay, 23 million base pairs of genome, 5,000 some odd genes, and they are able to do all this stuff. Live at two different temperatures. So th some of you have thought about you know what temperature you live. They live at ambient temperature in the mosquitoes, and then 37 degrees at us. They also invade four different types of cells. And they set up these shops in an incredible fashion. So, this is a, a highly streamlined, beautiful ecosystem. So, malaria is, is an ecosystem of combination of the mosquito, the man and the malaria parasite. They all have to work together to have the malaria to go on. Okay. So, that is a very quick uh, uh, life cycle description. Yes, ma'am. So, no, uh, there will be a different, totally different mosquito. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so you, you, this other thing very important to keep in mind. After this mosquito bites an uh, infected uh, human being and has this whole stage developing, she has to live for at least 14 days in order for her to transmit to the next person. So, if I have malaria and a mosquito bites me and then comes and bites you, you won't get malaria right away. It needs to be incubating for 14 days for it to do that. Okay, so it, it, it's again, it's an ecosystem. It's the way in when mosquitoes bite, you know, several times. I mean, they, their lifespan is about you know 25, 30 days at the most. Every time the red cells are lysed, it releases these quote-unquote toxins, which then re lead to a secretion of all these cytokines, which then give you the fever. So. This, this life cycle, this cycle, the blood stage cycle in the case of plasmodium falciparum and vivax is 48 hours. So, you get malaria every 48 hours, or dizzy, not malaria, the, the, the fever. But in falciparum, it gets complicated, it gets because you know, 
the things that emerge out of the liver is not always synchronized and because of that you may get asynchronous infection but virax is almost you know like like you can you can tell it by by clock when you get malaria okay so that's a, that's the the, the uh, very uh, quick description of uh, uh, life cycle so if you want to develop drugs yes yes go ahead uh, so do we know why it is specific to rbc's why do they invade rbc's because rbc's are enucleated cells yep. so why how can they complete the life cycle there it, it's very interesting because uh, uh, it, it why i cannot answer it, it, they decided to do so okay <laughs> but uh, they it is specific for red cells they ca cannot invade any other cells. So, there are specific receptors on the red cells that allow the merozoites to invade those. And the idea there is that you need to have uh, a rich source of hemoglobin. It is also inside, it, you know, it is living inside the bloodstream, but yet escaping your immune system. So, it becomes intracellular, goes inside the cell, it is protected from a lot of the immune reaction. There is a whole lot of immune immunology that I am not going to talk about in which the parasite actually changes its clothes, it has antigenic variation, so that it, it does not have the same antigen that it is going to be expressing all the time. Yeah. So, uh, it, the main reason is that it is a source of nutrients and source of uh, replication because you have so many red cells, right? You have huge number of red cells, it is a great place to invade and, and be transmitted you know, to the next, uh, next person. You, you have to remember that it is the transmission that is important. <laughs> it is the sexual stage that is important. Even though brief as it is, if it is not transmitted, there will not be any malaria. So, evolution selects for these things that you will have a large number of uh, progeny available. So, if you want to have drugs and that is what I am going to be talking about for malaria, where would you direct them? Well, one thing you can do is to kill the, the red cell stage. That is the disease causing stage. And most of the drugs that we have are what we call blood schizontocyte. They kill red cell stages of malaria parasite. You can also have uh, uh, things that will, the drugs that will kill gametocytes. That would be very nice as well. And not too many of those, but they, they would be good. It would not wouldn't do you a whole lot of good if it, the drug only kills gametocytes because you, know, you will still get a disease, but you will not transmit it to somebody else. Yeah. And that could be one way to really to do that, but you can have both combination things can it can kill gametocytes as well as kill uh, blood stages. Uh, then of course, there are things that would kill tissue schizons. So, uh, I did not tell you something which is actually a very important uh, point about the life cycle of these parasites. In the case of plasmodium falciparum, uh, it goes through liver in a quick fashion and gives you the progeny merozoites that go on to infect red cells. In the case of Plasmodium vivax and Plasmodium ovale, these two human parasites, some of the sporozoites that come in become dormant. They go and sleep and they are called hypnozoites, sleep zoite. The hypno means sleep, right? So, they sleep and they wake up at their own timetable. We do not know exactly what when they wake up. When they wake up, you get malaria. They wake up, they make more uh, merozoites and will invade um, red cells and cause disease. So, we have drugs that would kill schizon cells, you know, dividing cells in the liver, but we have only one drug that is approved right now that will get rid of the hypnozoites. That is called primaquin. That is the only drug that is available that can be used for what they call radical cure of malaria. Plasmodium vivax malaria is, is you know, is, is the, uh, the one that has uh, recurrent infection. So, you have relapsing malaria that can, you can get rid of it only by treating with uh, primaquine right now. And primaquine has some problems such as, uh, you know, uh, uh, hematological problems in people who have glucose 6-phosphate uh, dehydrogenase deficiency and so on. Yep. Okay. So, what are the existing antimalarials? Well, there are a whole bunch of quinoline derivatives, quinine, chloroquine, primaquine, mefloquine, amidioquine, lumifentrine, papraquine, all these are different quinoline kind of compounds. I okay. will talk about them, how they might be working. 
you have folate metabolism antagonists, meaning they interfere with folate synthesis or folate utilization. So, they will in, in, in a specific fashion against the parasite. Uh, the major part of the right now that are in use are artemisin and their derivatives. I will talk about that in a little bit because this is after all a natural product uh, 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 de drug development. Yes, uh, discuss, uh, you Okay. So there was one hour session on this. So on it's a good continuous. Okay, okay. So we'll we'll we'll, we'll cover that. Um, antibiotics. Some of the antibiotics also work against uh, malaria parasites. Uh, tetracyclines, macrolides, clindamycin works against that, and it usually is working through those weird organelles, the mitochondrion and epicoplast. It's working through those as well. Uh, Hydroxynaphthoquinone is atovaquone, which is uh, works against the mitochondrial electron transport chain. It's something that my lab worked on for a number of years and then there is another they call uh, pyronaridine is, is, is another class altogether. So, anyway, so quinine, this is still being used. It was this, it was being used in South America by the local uh, tribes, uh, the, the uh, original Americans in South America and Peru especially and it was in, in this, this tree, tree's bark that it was present. And this was the first medicinal chemistry uh, uh, study that was ever ever taken up. So, you can take purify pure component of this chinkona bark uh, powder that gave you uh, anti malaria activity. And our own history, you know, the world's history has, was changed by this. Okay? If quinine was not discovered, not available to the extent that it was, Africa would not have been conquered by the Europeans. <laughs> they were dying like flies when they go into <laughs> interiors because malaria was rampant. Like Greek uh, soldiers, Alexander. Alexander came here and had to go back. There was no quinine at that time. The so Indians did not give the Ayurvedic <laughs> <laughs> They kept it secret. They kept it secret, yeah. Good idea. Uh, military strategies, you know. So, uh, in fact, it's true that uh, more people have more casualties have occurred due to malaria than the bullets in all the wars. Okay, that's that's how how rampant these things have been. So, anyway, now oh, this, this is this is this is interesting. You know, these are British troops taking the daily quinine of five grains uh, in uh, in this uh, Salonika front. And the, this gentleman is make sure that they take it, because that was the best way to get out of fighting and dying in a war. You know, get malaria. Don't take your uh, your prophylactic quinine, and you'll be all right. So this guy, uh, the colonel or whatever he is, he is, is it's, it's, it's make sure. It's domes, not dots. No. <laughs> yeah, directly observable. <laughs> dots. Yeah. Okay. So this is this is the the quinine story. What quinine and, and many of the other other uh, quinoline drugs seem to do is to they interfere with this this uh, major uh, metabolic phenomenon of malaria parasites. So they are digesting hemoglobin, okay, and it's going to generate a lot of heme, okay. And it doesn't have a heme oxygenase to clip it up and you know take the iron out and all. It doesn't parasite doesn't have the capacity. So, what it has done is to figure out a way to crystallize this heme into, uh, into these crystals. So, it, it forms dimers of these and they form these crystals that is crystal core hem hemozoin. It is also called malaria pigment. So, it is, the, it is the, for the lack of a better word, the poop of malaria parasite. Okay. So, they digest away all that hemoglobin and put it into, into these, uh, these um, uh, hemozoin crystals. The drugs, the quinoline, quinoline compounds, chloroquine especially, seems to interfere with this dimerization and precipitation and crystallization of the, the, the hemoglobin hemo heme that is generated from that. Yeah. And because of that, you have got a lot more heme being built up inside the food vacuum and that can create problem for the parasite. It essentially gets really severe diarrhea, I guess. I mean, I do not know if it is diarrhea or not. It's, it's, uh, I like to use these anthropomorphic terms, but you know, <laughs> essentially it is it's going to be <coughs> damaging to the parasite. Okay. Sorry? 
I, I mean, we don't know exactly. We still don't know how lack of polymerization of uh, hemozoin uh, leads to parasite death. I mean, some of the things we assume that it is due to the heme toxicity or uh, iron. Uh, iron is not, uh, there is no free iron. It is still bound to heme. Uh, but it uh, is creating reactive oxygen species and a whole bunch of other stuff that is happening from that, that. We just assume that that is what is killing the parasite. So, chloroquine was actually uh, has been active in only in those stages that are actively degrading hemoglobin. So, chloroquine will not work in the liver stage. Liver stage there is no hemoglobin degradation. So, it does not work against the, uh, the schizons in the liver, but it does inhibit uh, blood stages. Okay. So, only because because of its the way in which it works, it only works against the uh, those stages that degrade hemoglobin. Now, chloroquine actually gets concentrated at millimolar concentration inside the food vacuum. Chloroquine can be can get protonated. It is it is a, it is a, it is a nitrogen which can be protonated at two different places. So you can get diprotonation. What happens is that because of that, the food vacuole is acidic, and all this protonated uh, chloroquine accumulates in there. So even if you have nanomolar or, or uh, nanomolar concentration of chloroquine outside, it gets to be millimolar concentration in the food vacuole, and that's the reason this whole uh, the, the drug works the way it does. Um, so it, and we talked about how how uh, it actually leads to the swelling of the food vacuole and pigment clumping and so on. So it essentially works through this uh, interference with uh, polymerization of uh, hemoglobin. And as I, as I discussed, you know, it's the protonation of uh, of uh, this nitrogen and and this nitrogen that leads to its uh, uh, accumulation in the food vacuum. So that's common to all the, you know, Not uh, most of them have uh, protonated. They have most of the protonable so nitrogen. So anything that would so like no, it doesn't get uh, protonated though. It's uh, yeah. Uh, it's uh, these, these are so the question was would do they uh, do all the other quinolines also get uh, similarly protonated and concentrated inside the food vacuole in general that is the case but not the same level that the studies have not been done as extensively as they've been done with the chloroquine so if you have uh, any mechanism so you get all this chloroquine pouring into your uh, food vacuole which is your stomach essentially if you are a malaria parasite and uh, if you can figure out how to vomit it out, that can help. So that's what parasite figured it out. The parasite figured out how to vomit chloroquine out, and that caused a huge problem. It created a huge problem in the world. Chloroquine was a fantastic drug for you know 30 years or so. Resistance started being seen in in uh, 1960s or 50 60s over in south america and and and, and 50s over in and and uh, uh, southeast asia and then it spread this spread because chloroquine was used as as a single drug and th there's a lesson in in this whole thing <coughs> for any antimicrobial drug if you use a single drug resistance will come about it's guaranteed to come about so always try to use combination Combination therapy should be de rigueur for all antimicrobial treatments. Antibiotics included should really try to use it so that you can minimize the resistance development that would occur. Yeah. So this became a huge problem, and then clearly there was a need for finding alternatives to that. Yeah. Well, out came the Chinese uh, with their with their uh, with their uh, uh, millennials old. Uh, drug uh, that they used in Chinese medicine. Now, it's very interesting that this whole thing. I, I, some of you may have heard that last year, in, in 2015, the Nobel Prize was awarded to uh, uh, to. Yeah, oh, they just you just had a, a session on that. Okay, so I will not belabor that point. But you know, th this is very important. So this clearly came about, came from that. So I will not talk about how artemisinin came about, you know, how that was developed. There is a lot to be learned, and I think in the next few lectures you will hear how reverse pharmacology can. Like be, uh, 
So, Vietnam War was the driving force, not for just for artemisinin, but also for mefloquin. So, so, you know, people are dying, you know, people are having really problem in Vietnam because of the resistance to chloroquine. So, Mao to ask his, uh, his uh, army or <laughs> his people to develop uh, whatever they can find from the traditional Chinese medicine. And Walter Reed Army Institute of Research in US uh, restarted their program. By the way, that program was going on in 1940s during the World War II. The chloroquine came about, again, this is a very interesting point. The chloroquine came about because Japanese occupied all the Chinkona farms in the Southeast Asia. So, there were no more chloroquine available, I mean, quinine available. So, they had a major, I mean, it was as big, by the way, it was as big an effort as Manhattan Project, which was to develop atom bomb. There were as many people involved in developing anti malaria drug in 1940s, from which chloroquine came. So, yeah, have wars, I guess, that's one way to do that. <laughs> there is to be a national commitment to that. and and. and not wait for war. That yeah, you know, uh, I hope not. I hope it doesn't take another war to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. All right, we'll go over this. Uh, uh, we work, talked about the mechanism of action uh, to some extent for Artemisin. Uh, no, that you can go. Okay. We discussed the you you took uh, journey. A journey. How how she. How from right. Uh, just right. an idea from traditional knowledge yeah. reached to the yeah. stage of. Yeah, so these are all the different derivatives. So this is artemisinin, okay, and this endoperoxide bridge is the critical part of of that, and that needs to be activated in some way to to work through that. Uh, these, this is uh, dihydroartemisinin. So artemisinin actually gets converted to dihydroartemisinin. That is the active compound, and its half life is very short. Dihydro uh, uh, dihydroartemisinin lasts 20 minutes in the bloodstream. It's really really fast. I mean, that's one of the reasons why. Artemisin is, is, is problems, you know, you have to give it for seven days and all that if you use it as, as a single agent. Yeah. And then there are other others, artemether, artether, artesunate, artelinate, all these different uh, uh, modifications of that, which then allow you to, you know, some of them can be formulated in injectables and, and so on. So, yeah. so that, that's important. Uh, and this has been really, really a lifesaver. Ever since uh, uh, ACT, it's called artemisin in combination therapy, that was recommended by WHO and adapted by the rest of the countries, uh, rest of the nations, they actually uh, reduced the malaria incidence. So, the malaria incidence and mortality have dropped 50 to 60 percent in the last 15 years. That's a, that's a, that's a great achievement. But to a large extent, that was because of the artificial combination therapy one, use of bed nets. You know, and, and overall availability of, uh, of uh, healthcare systems in, in the areas that are most uh, widely affected, most uh, deeply affected by malaria. New resistance which is being emerged in the Southeast Asian countries because of optimism also for the combination therapy. Right here. So, so before I go there, uh, you know, just to talk about uh, artemisinin is always used in combination. There are different, uh, different uh, compounds that are that are used in combination. So, artemisinin can be combined with lumefantrine, papyroquine, pyronaridine uh, and amidioquine. So, those are the four major uh, com combined partner drugs right now. And they, they, the reason for that is that artemisinin, as I said, it is very short lived, right. So, it is like, like a Rambo, you know, commando going up, shoom, shooting and then going away. Then you need the marines to come and clean up. Okay, and the marines are, are these drugs. Okay, lumefantrine, all they are longer lasting drugs, so they hang around for a long enough time, so they will clean up the clean up the remaining parasites. The problem is, as 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 Ashwin rightly point out, that you have uh, resistance developing. Uh, it's not true resistance; it is a lack of clinical response, quick clinical response. So instead of uh, uh, Parasites clearing within uh, within 48 hours or, th or so in three days treatment, they take a little longer. They, they take longer. They take five days or, or so for and 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 that can be replicated in in vitro as well. So it, this is a ring stage assay that they call it. That's what it actually has allowed you allowed us to to understand what the resistance is due to. And now it's it's really common and unfortunately is also 
resistance to paparaquin that is developed in the same region. So, in, in Vietnam and Cambodia, uh, uh, where artemisinin uh, clinical efficacy has gone down, there is also evidence that paparaquin is not working either. Fortunately, paparaquin resistance is associated with uh, mefloquine sensitivity. So, you can go back to that drug. So, th there are ways in which you can actually put these things together. So, to, to at least extend the, the life of, of these drugs. You, you realize that if this starts spreading, comes into our country here and then goes to Africa, we are up the creek without a paddle. We do not, not know what to do. And so, one idea has been that let us just you know put all our resources to eliminate this parasites that are in Southeast Asia using these different drug combinations and then and, and whatever we need to do. Mass drug administration is being talked about because it is not the malaria patients who are the most problem for many parts. It is the asymptomatic malaria carriers who are have gametocytes in their bloodstream. They are not affected. Uh, they are not showing any disease are the ones that we need to really identify and get rid of those parasites from them. And that is right now uh, a major effort that, that, that people are undertaking to, to uh, do that. Now, a key thing is about all this stuff is that there is a goal that WHO and many nations have put together including India that we are going to eliminate and er eventually eradicate malaria. Guess what? Sri Lanka eliminated malaria this year. Sri Lanka eliminated malaria this year, can be done, okay? and it can be done in India as well, but it will need to be done locally. You need to focus on local areas, local transmission capacity, local epidemiology, local controls of, of mosquitoes and so on in order to do that. Okay. So, uh, there, there may be as many as 20 additional countries that would have eliminated malaria by 2020, including China. China will eliminate malaria by 2020, but these are low hanging fruits, okay guys, <laughs> this is something that you can easily do because you know, China probably has a few thousand cases of malaria at the most, okay. India millions, Africa hundreds of millions, South America there is a possibility. So, different parts of the world will have different ways in which they are going to get rid of malaria. So, it is a it is an ongoing process and it requires long term commitment and you cannot let your guards down because we did in 1960s malaria was, was almost gone from India and we said we cannot take care of it. We did not pay attention to the, to the tribal regions where malaria is the most prevalent and it came back as you know in, in 70s, 80s and 90s malaria was a huge problem. It has gone down now in, in, in India as well. So, that is something to really keep in mind. So, uh, we will not go into the details about artificial resistance, but it is all centered mostly in in this part of the of the world. That is where all this resistance seems to come about. Now, people wonder whether that is because the, the parasites are somewhat strange over there, so that they can actually develop resistance or because you have some really outstanding researchers working over there who can detect resistance coming about quickly. Uh, there is a debate about that, you know, so it is interesting. Anyway, uh, we now know uh, what the molecular marker for this resistance is. It is uh, on, on this particular uh, gene called K13 okay, or a clutch do propeller domain protein on, on chromosome number 13. Mutations in that are associated with this, this phenotype that you see not go into much detail about that, but you can see that that particular mutation, these are all, this is the green is the wild type and all these colors are different mutations in that Kelch 13 uh, gene and you can see that uh, some parts are, you know, this particular mutation called uh, cysteine 582 tyrosine mutation, C580Y mutation is really common all over here, okay, in this part, palin and, and, and so on. So, and these things are now, you know, spreading in, in that region. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, what do we do? Designing new drugs. We'll need to develop new drugs. Continuous. If you want to eliminate malaria, eradicate malaria, we'll need to be putting an effort for next 50 years or even more of uh, having 
whole bunch of uh, measures at our disposal. Mosquito control, uh, uh, vaccines possibly, we do not have anything yet, but drugs, we will need drugs. And for that purpose, over the last 15 years, there have been, you know, significant effort has been uh, devoted by an organization called Medicines for Malaria Venture, uh, MMV. So, MMV uh, has, 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 has a pipeline which is comparatively quite robust. When I started working on malaria, and that is about 30 years back, when I started working on malaria parasites, there was not a single drug in the pipeline except for chloroquine. Uh, artemisinin was being used, but it was not being used in, 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 the, in, in the West at all. There was nothing. Now, we have got a whole bunch of things at the research, at the lead generation, at lead optimization, the preclinical, uh, human volunteer studies, product development and access, the whole bunch of things that are in the pipeline. Not, a, not any one of them has actually been delivered. I mean, we have got, you know, combination of different things that are, that are post approval, but they are in the, in the pipeline and it is really uh, encouraging, uh, but yet we need to, you know, continue this effort. So, uh, uh, among these is, is a compound called PA92, and uh, if you can read very small letters over there, it says Drexel, that is where I am based. Uh, we delivered this as, as a translational or preclinical candidate for, for antimalarial. Uh, there are also other drugs as well in, in this, in, in this uh, part. So, so uh, just to tell you about what is required, what is required of the new antimalarials that are being developed. What are the target product profiles uh, and target candidate profiles for, for antimalarials according to MMB? So, MMB is, is an organization uh, uh, consisting of medicinal chemists and uh, clinicians and so on who do not do the things themselves. They actually work with academic institutions, industry uh, and so on and partner them together uh, and they have an extensive network which has been involved in, in these, uh, these drug developments. And, and uh, they are the ones who actually supported our, our effort on this compound that I will tell you about, about in, in a little while. So, th wh what are the target uh, product profiles and target uh, candidate profiles? These are called the uh, uh, TPPs and TCPs. So, TPP1 is this. This, this is the what they call holy grail, you know, in, 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 uh, in Bible. You know, this is what we are chasing uh, is a single exposure radical cure and prophylaxis. One exposure, you come to the clinic, go and see uh, 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 Ashwin and he will give you one pill and that is it. You have been cured, you have been prophylactic, you, you will not get malaria. That is the ideal situation. We do not have anything like that. We do not have. Yeah. So, this is to radical cure. Radical cure meaning you are know, killing those hypnozoites as well, right? Remember? And that is not easy. We do not have anything. But that is the goal, okay? Uh, and this this would be uh, for uncomplicated malaria in children and adults. We can also have single exposure chemo protection, meaning you just take one drug and you will be protected for months together. And that would be very important uh, to, to have. Uh, so, those are the, the, uh, the target product profiles that we are looking for. Uh, candidate profiles, you need to have fast clearance, okay. So, it is uh, reducing the initial uh, parasite burden, fast clearance of the parasite, that should work fast, it should go and, you know, as I said, like a Rambo, you know, just go and shoot them all up and uh, kill the parasites. We need to have that. Uh, you can have uh, the long duration, oops, sorry, uh, long duration uh, partner to complete the clearance, we need to have a good, uh, uh, good partner for that. And uh, it, it should be targeting hypnozoites, okay. non-dividing parasite stages, including gametocytes. Gametocytes do not divide, you know, until they are taken up by mosquitoes. Okay. And it can also give you chemo protection. Those are the, the, the criteria that, that uh, they would like to uh, have for, for the candidate uh, compounds. Okay. So, I am going to take a little diversion and tell you all about research that has gone on in, in our lab. Uh, and Please stop me when I should stop because I, I can, I've got 70 slides. So, 
<laughs> I don't want to bore you to death, but you know, I'll try my best. <laughs> but <laughs> okay. So I told you that these parasites have to get inside another cell, right? Mother parasites, in order for them to grow, have to go get inside another cell. How do they do that? Red cells, they, since they have to get into red cells, red cells don't have endocytic endocytosis. They don't do endocytosis. So the only way a parasite can get into these cells, and in fact they use the same machinery to get into any cells, and there are four different types of cells that they get in, they use their own motor to, to drive themselves in. So this is how th that happens. So the uh, parasite comes in contact with the, with the uh, red cell plasma membrane, it reorients itself, and it uh, makes a tight junction at its apical end. This is its apical end. There are several organelles that are present in the the apical part of the parasites called the uh, trees and micronemes and all that they are all very important in getting the parasite into the into the uh, red cell. So they form this tight junction and it literally drives itself into the parasite and this is done by this, this motor complex <coughs> that is present. This motor complex is, uh, is uh, consists of uh, 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 myosin okay. So this is the myosin uh, motor with its light chain called M tip and it combines with this uh, other molecules and they are embedded in the parasite uh, inner membrane complex and so on. So, the way it is driven is by just like our muscle, it is an actin myosin muscle, okay. Parasite is its own muscle that drives in. It essentially goes and grabs the membrane of the, of the, of the uh, red cell and pulls it over itself, just like you pull the the blanket over you in in a cold wintry night okay the parasite just slips into the par into red cell red cell doesn't have an idea that has happened what has happened and it grows in there so my colleague bill bergman discovered this particular molecule called mtip bill bergman is, is is a professor at, at drexel and he in collaboration with wim hall and and, and others over in in university of washington in seattle they crystallize uh, this uh, this particular molecule M tip. Now M tip binds to myosin through just 15 amino acids. Just last 15 amino acids is all it needs for it to bind to to uh, to uh, myosin. Okay. The 15 amino acids of the of the uh, of the myosin is all it requires, and that uh, structure was solved. And when this that structure was solved. Okay, I don't think I'll be able to uh, do the video of that, but we knew that this is the peptide that is present in this uh, this uh, this cleft, and we knew the structure of that. And for that, what, what we did was structure-based uh, uh, design of novel molecules, small molecules. So this this is what what was started in you know taking the structure um, uh, of the 15 amino acid, finding out what the contacts were made for that. From that, we designed a, a pharmacophore, and this was all done by an outstanding colleague, uh, Sandhya Kotegari, she is uh, an associate professor now at, at Drexel, and she uh, uh, designed this this uh, in silico or computational method of uh, looking for molecules. So she screened three million compounds virtually, and from that, this is the this is the the funniest part of that. So, I, I'm a molecular biologist, and I didn't believe in this structure base. You know, I said, "No, oh, come on, it's not going to work." You know. So, so she sent us 15 compounds that she selected off the shelf. These are not synthesized compounds. You can buy them from uh, from commercial sources. Uh, from this whole uh, search that she did, she sent 15 compounds, and I said, "Sure, we'll test them." We tested them. One of them was 115 nanomolar inhibitor of the parasite growth. I thought, "Wow." That was very interesting. So she used that structure to screen the next level, and she found, you know, other molecules of 50 nanomolar inhibitor. And the third screen, she didn't get anything better, but she got some other compounds which about 100, 300 nanomolar inhibitors as well. But it divided them up into two different classes. The, they were all, they all of them had a pyrazole moiety, but it had different series. So, there is a series A compound and series B compound. Okay. So, this is a series B compound and it is a pyrazole urea. Okay. This is pyrazole amide. 
Okay, this is pyrazole urea, two nitrogens over here, and that was the one that di uh, distinguished the two molecules. Now these compounds actually worked on the DEM motor. You know, the motor that we, we started out with, it actually inhibited this gliding motility of these invading forms. It inhibited them. But we could make it better only up to about 60 nanomolar doing the you know, medicinal chemistry. So we had about more than 80 so were synthesized from that and we got about 60 nanomolar inhibitor of the falciparum. But those were like brick dust. They were not soluble. They were horrible from drug development point of view. So our colleague uh, at MMB who was supporting this work, he said, why don't you guys you know, focus on this series? This, this looks better. You know, and as soon as we started working on that and now we synthesized more than 400 such compounds and all these were you know less than nanomolar activity. But they had no activity on the gliding motor. <laughs> so it was the target was totally different but it was better as a drug. So this is sort of interesting. From this virtual screen we get these compounds we think that they are targeting they are not targeting that but they are pretty good compounds. Okay, and that's how things happen in in, in in drug development, drug discovery stuff. That things just go, you know, they're meandering way to really to get to the point that that we do. So um, now this is the this is the first compound that we got. This is the one that was uh, uh, 150 nanomolar compound that we got off the shelf. This came from from you know the commercial source, and then uh, from the second series, another commercial source gave you a 50 nanomolar in a, uh, compound called compound 2-1. And from these, we have a series of different pyrazolamides that have been synthesized, and they have been, uh, you know, uh, taken further. Uh, they really inhibit uh, uh, parasite growth uh, uh, at all different stages. Uh, this is a growth inhibition assay for uh, different uh, uh, stages of the parasite. Uh, they also kill gametocytes, which is important because we wanted to get rid of gametocytes as well. Okay, so the gametocytes were killed by these compounds. These were both the females and male gametocytes were killed by, by this, this compound. Um, it also worked on vivax as well as falciparum. So it had uh, activity against uh, both uh, vivax and falciparum at the rings and trophozoite stages. So this was this is a pretty good compound. It also worked in vivo, and this is where it became really interesting. It was the one of the fastest killer in vivo that this group had seen. These are our collaborators who did the work in, in a humanized mouse. I will not belabor the point, but they used uh, a not skid mouse in which uh, uh, human red cells are infected. So you can actually do human parasite infection in, in a mouse. So it is the humanized mouse that we used for that. And the, the rate at which this was killing is, was as fast if not faster than artemisinin in vivo. So that was very exciting. So this compound is very highly potent. Okay. So you just uh, just uh, inoculate red cells. You in, in, uh, inoculate red cells uh, into these mice, and they have human red cells circulating. Well, yeah, not permanently. You do them for seven days, and then they are ready to be infected. And the infection is carried out only for a short period of time. So, you know, so, uh, so you can see that there's just a few days of infection, and they have enough red cells uh, around to do that. It's highly standardized. So, you know, you can, you can, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, they are highly potent against all lab strains, um, uh, and they have a good therapeutic window. Uh, you know, there's a, a minimum toxicity uh, thing was done in rats. Uh, and, and, and dogs, uh, uh, studies were done, um, uh, rapid clearance of the parasite the model system as I showed and uh, the cost was very low. The cost of production is really low. Okay? So that was another very important uh, aspect of this, this, this stuff. And this whole thing was published uh, in, uh, in uh, October of 2014 uh, after a couple of years of delay and all that we published this work because of the issues that are specific to the patents and all that other stuff. So uh, these, are, these are very potent and what they do is disrupt sodium homeostasis. Okay, so uh, I'm going to end with um, very molecular and, and, and basic science study which 
I will actually finish in very sh quick time. I'll actually go very much to the end of my talk and, and talk about the model that we have, how these um, drugs that how this drug particularly uh, and and others similar to that are working. So, so uh, we published this uh, in Nature Communication, and you know, it's been delivered as a, as a candidate, and you know, it's like. Uh, uh, my my uncle had, had a poem saying that uh, I just spread the the seeds and it's up to the clouds and the earth to see what it happens to it. Okay, <laughs> so so in, in most cases uh, that's that's what you you need to do. Uh, you just uh, I I have just scattered the seeds and let the clouds and the earth take care of it afterwards. So so let's see what because I'm a basic molecular biologist, so I'm interested in how these drugs actually work. Uh, we will not go into this, this, I'm just going to go through this rather fast, okay, go. So uh, we, we develop uh, resistance to these, uh, uh, these drugs, it can come about very quickly and we figured out what the mechanism by which resistance works and that actually told us what the target of this, this com these compounds could be as well. Well, when we were working on that about the same time, this particular paper came out and it's called uh, it's described this compound called spiroindolone, the potent compound class of uh, for treatment of malaria, and this came from Novartis. Uh, Novartis group uh, came up with that. And I'll just read this particular paragraph because it's relevant to 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 this uh, this uh, uh, winter school. So to, to identify novel anti-malarial leads, we and others have screened diverse chemical libraries using plasmodium wholesale proliferation. <coughs> Excuse me wholesale proliferation uh, assays with uh, cultured erythrocytic uh, 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 parasite. So from a library of about 12,000 pure natural products and synthetic compounds with structural features found in natural products, our screen identified 275 primary hits with sub micromolar uh, molar activity against plasmodium falciparum. And we discarded those hits with activity uh, whose activity was not reconfirmed against multidrug resistant parasites and or that displayed some cytotoxicity against mammalian cells. More than 50 percent viability inhibition at 10 micromolar. So if they were cytotoxic at 10 micromolar or, or, or less, they were discarded. Pharmacokinetics and physical properties were then determined for remaining 17 compounds. From this, a synthetic compound related to spiroazepinindol compound, spiroindolone compound stood out as a starting point for medicinal chemistry lead. So this was a natural product st structure from which this compound came about. Okay. So this came from a natural product library. Okay. Synthesis and evolution of about 200 derivatives of this compound yielded the optimized uh, spiro tetrahydro beta carboline or spiroinolone compound NITD 609. NITD 609 later named as KE 609 and it is now called cipargamin has gone through phase 2 trial, phase 2B trials and it is being uh, been tried out in Africa as well. Okay. So, <coughs> right, they, they do not found those uh, with, with this particular structure. I will show the structure of that. Okay. Uh, so uh, this compound is synthesized in eight steps, including a chiral separation. The chiral chirality was very important. There was only uh, one chiral form actually worked, uh, and it displays the physical chemical properties compatible with conventional tablet formulation. In fact, they have formulated is that. So uh, here are several structurally diverse compounds. They all seem to be working through this same pathway. So remember, I went through this very quickly. The resistance that came about and all the resistance was due to uh, mutations in uh, one particular protein called PFATP4, which is uh, a sodium, likely sodium pump. Okay. It is a sodium pump and the mutations were in the sodium pump. Okay. So this uh, uh, then it allowed us to, really to look at other compounds and it turns out that this is the spironolone Ashoka, this compound over here. Okay. Uh, th th that is a spironolone. Uh, and, and then we had these are the compounds that came from our work, uh, 92 and 50 over here. These are spiroindolones and there is yet another compound called SJ733 
it is actually iso dihydroisoquinolone. So yeah. these two minerals, yeah. six or nine and two four six. Yeah. Is it uh, carbon is uh, modified that is not right? Yeah, I, I, I assume so. I don't know that all the different de details what they did for that. Yeah, but th they were the 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 only thing that in the clinical trials they have found. Hmm? Oh yeah, nanomolars. Uh, the, the, this thing, these things work in nanomolar concentration. So, minim minimal inhibitory concentration actually, MIC, in vivo. They just came up with a paper in, uh, doing uh, MIC in vivo. It's 0.1 nanogram. I mean, these are fantastic compounds. You know, so, uh, so this is really, really very, very. Sorry. Safety. Uh, there haven't been any problems uh, so far. The only thing they have found is uh, uh, some red coloration of, of a byproduct in the semen of some of men. So, uh, uh, cepergamine, the 609 compound, one single, okay, maybe I have it in the next slide, let us see. Yes, single 30 milligram dose cleared the parasite from the bloodstream in less than 12 hours. 30 milligram single oral dose. So it is a remarkable, remarkable compound, and, and ours is working through the same mechanism. Okay, not only that. What's important is to keep in mind is that at least 16 other chemical classes, totally chemically very different classes, other than the ones that I've shown over here, they all seem to be af uh, affecting sodium homeostasis in the parasite. So which, which part of all the three molecules work on which part of the three molecules work on the sodium pump? Well, we because don't know. Sodium pump gets we, 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 we don't know. We don't have a structure information on the, on the actual target. It so uh, maybe I can show you what what's going on. So it 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 affects sodium uh, sodium uh, homeostasis, and uh, it, uh, it this particular uh, ATP ATPase is belongs to this sodium pump. And it has. Uh, uh, we also found that the same, same thing with our compound. But here is what you are asking for. So the way we measure this is by sodium uh, influx is in the parasite. I will not go into the technical details of this, but you can see that uh, uh, our compound, the pyrazolamide compounds, as well as uh, uh, as well as the spironolone compounds, they all uh, cause sodium influx inside the parasite. So you take the parasite within within seconds. The parasite uh, start getting sodium in that. Artemisin doesn't do that. Artemisin. Okay. Not only that, uh, for you, for some of the really interesting SAR is this. Okay. So you have uh, 92 with uh, with uh, methyl N methyl over here, and here is hydrogen. Okay. See the difference. The only difference is between this and this is methyl group, it completely kills it. Not only that the compound is inactive. Yeah. So specific, it, is it is it is pretty specific, yeah. Uh, we don't know exactly where it binds and not all the things we don't know all the details of that. But yeah this is a this is the the really pretty uh, this work from Suyash Patnagar, uh, the motorcycle guy over there. So the Novartis studies were done at NITD, no Novartis Institute of Tropical Disease in uh, Singapore. Singapore. Uh, that's where they did the initial screens. Uh, they, the screen was done actually at uh, in San Diego. The, the library was at NITD in Singapore. Uh, so it was most. It was they. They are the ones who are have the, all the patents and all that themselves. Our compound, uh, the one that we I talked about, it was a multi uh, institutional. Uh, there was, so the patent that we have is that uh, is uh, uh, from uh, MMV and Drexel are the main main part partners. Novartis also is is a co-inventor, and so is uh, uh, University of Washington. But they're they're not the the main partners. But Drexel and MMV are the partners. Just trying to imagine what happens next uh, after the sodium goes in, and how okay. does that? Uh, okay, so uh, so th I will describe that in five minutes very fast because it, it, that's what actually is keeps me awake at night. You know, it, it keeps me awake at night. Why? What happens when the sodium goes in? Why do the parasites die? And it's something that we've been working on. I can go into details, but this paper has been published uh, in in PLOS Pathogen just uh, this year, so I will not go into the detail. 
But what it does, it causes cholesterol to accumulate into the plasma membrane of the parasite. So, the parasite's plasma membrane is devoid of cholesterol. Okay, it is sort of very interesting why parasite, so it is surrounded by red cell in which the 50 percent of its lipids is cholesterol. Red cells membrane, plasma membrane, 50 percent is cholesterol. The parasitophilus vacuolar membrane, that is the vacuole in which the parasite lives, that has cholesterol. But the plasma membrane of the parasite in the trophozoite stage and as it is developing in the red cell, does not have cholesterol. It could be, but it uh, it's not the case with other uh, epicomplex in parasites. It's not the case. Uh, this is specific for plasmodium in the red cells. It may not be in the liver stage either. We don't know, and that is to a large extent because it needs to keep them. This is what I think. Okay, it needs to keep the membrane of, of the of the of the, of the parasite's membrane more flexible. Less cholesterol makes the the membrane less rigid. So, the, the, the metaphor that, that some of my colleagues like to use is that this is like a red cell as it is going through the, through the blood stream. I mean, you, if you ever seen the, the red cells going through capillaries and other places, they are very fast. I mean, they are going you know, really like, like, uh, like a, a racetrack, you know, NASCAR ra racetrack or Formula 1 kind of thing. Okay? So, it is like red cell that is infected with malaria parasite. It has it, it somehow wants to escape the spleen. If it goes through the spleen, it gets eaten up and gets removed. So falciparum has the ability to adhere to to the uh, endothelial cells, and it's like like uh, a, a, a Volkswagen uh, stuck on a Formula One track. Okay, everything is going shum shum by it. Okay, as going through that, it if it is not too rigid. It can just you know go around and let it go. I mean, it's like you know, it's like a rubber kind of uh, skin. But if it gets rigid, it gets knocked out. That's the model. That's, that's teleology. Good teleology. It's a, it's a model that that we we think is going. Uh, that that's the reason for its fast killing in vivo. This is the fastest killing set of compounds. Ninety-two uh, cypragamin. All these things are the fastest killing parasite in vivo. No. In vitro, they do not kill that fast. So, in vitro, if you treat these with these drugs and wash the drug off, you can expose them up to 40 hours, 24 hours, 70, 80 percent of the parasites still viable, still alive. Okay. But in vivo, they get knocked out and that is what we think is going on. I am not going to belabor a whole lot of thing on that, what we did, how we showed that. This has been this has been published. There are a bunch of other things that happen. The, oh, yeah, this this is what happens. So, so, this is another thing that seems to happen after treatment of the parasite. This is untreated parasite trophozoite stage. What you see over here is the nucleus, uh, red cell uh, outside. Here is the parasite's plasma membrane. You know some Golgi and uh, ER and mitochondria, all that stuff inside, right? You treat them. You start seeing things like this narrowing of the nucleus starts to divide or you get uh, uh, you know formation of this uh, IMC kind of structure. So it's, it's as if parasite has been giving the signal to start dividing prematurely. So, it is a premature signal to divide and that is, is what results in this and you can see these are just this is 2 hour of exposure by the way, just 2 hours of exposure <coughs> causes parasites to go through all these various structures very strange kind of structures, including what looks like sky zones. Yeah. I am not going to belabor this because I have taken too much of your time already, so I'll please forgive me. They, they, they do not they don't truly divide, but they try to divide and, and, uh, and, and that causes the problems for them. So, these are all the different structures. This is the model that we have. The sodium comes in at a high. So, there is a natural signal that is through sodium. That is my hypothesis that the sodium acts as a natural signal when it goes into the into the cells at a very late stage, very, very late stage in schizogony when you have formed all the different uh, uh, nuclei, nuclei have been divided, uh, uh, all the organelles have been formed, the rock trees and micronemes have all been formed and they are all sitting around ready to, to be divided. Sodium acts as a signal which then 
In, fa in fact, inhibits this cholesterol pump. There is an active cholesterol pump, and I didn't talk about that, but we have some evidence that there is a molecular uh, entity that does that, and that leads to uh, 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 presence of cholesterol in the merozoite plasma. By the way, trophozoites don't have cholesterol; merozoites do, because they need to be rigid as they are coming out of that. So, so this is the normal. The green is the normal uh, pathway and this is the drug induced pathway that leads to premature schizogony and death. Okay. That is the, that's the model that, that we use. So, uh, boy, this is pretty bad. Go ahead. Anyway, this, this I already talked about, the hypothesis, forget about it, but I just should really thank the people. I, I, I do not do the work uh, in my lab much, uh, if at all. Uh, and, and we have. Uh, because, 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 my brother uh, and my sister-in-law, Dr. Svaidya, were the ones who inspired me to be a scientist. So I, I thank you for that. It's your fault. It's your fault. So, uh, and 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 you know, uh, other individuals have uh, Arkang Fan and Zhang Zhang are the ones who synthesize all those parazolamide compounds. Isabel Copens did those beautiful electron microscopy that you saw. Uh, Natalie Spillman, Kieran Kirk uh, helped us with, uh, with the sodium homeostasis assays, which is uh, established in our lab. I didn't talk about uh, the collaboration that we have with uh, Dan Goldberg's lab. We've been funded by NIH and, and uh, MMV. Uh, this is uh, our uh, Center for Molecular Parastology over at Drexel. And I, I, I should just show this slide also. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is my group, my lab group. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you.